Good morning, everyone. You guys doing good today? Today is a very good day because yesterday was a really good day. I know that there might be some Christians on the Oklahoma Sooners team, but God just loves us more. And it's good to be in church, huh? Let's all of us stand to our feet. We're going to do something that we do every single week here. We're going to wrap our understanding around a collection of phrases that we call our shoreline creed. And we do this every single Sunday because what separates Christianity from every other religion or philosophy in life is the magnificence of God's amazing grace. And so we just recite it to remind ourselves of what separates Christianity from everything else, what God has done for us. If you're new to Shoreline, uh, please feel free to read along. The rest of us, we're going to say this with some enthusiasm and passion. And before we do that, let's give a huge welcome to everyone who's watching online. Come on, let's give it up for our online congregation. We love you guys so very much. Okay, you guys ready? A little bit more enthusiasm than you showed yesterday watching the game, okay? Are you guys ready? <laughs> okay, here we go. I am loved by God. I cannot earn it. I cannot lose it. I am forgiven and made brand new. In Christ, I live with passion and purpose. I am empowered by the Spirit to be the church in the world and to live this love revolution. Come on, let's give God praise for that. And you may be seated. Today, we are going to kind of reconnect with a series that we've been doing actually throughout the course of the whole year. We started uh, at the beginning of the year uh, unpacking the book of Philippians uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We did that for a number of weeks, and then we paused, and we kind of went in a different direction. We came back to it at the end of the spring, a little bit into the summer, and then we kind of got away from it for a couple of uh a couple of months, and now we're going to finish it out, and so we're going to pick it up today and talk about it for the next couple of weeks, and we are finding ourselves in Philippians chapter 3. Now, before we get to the key verse that I want to share with you today, I want to remind you that as a follower of Christ, we ought to think differently than the people that are uh, in our culture or in our world who are not followers of Christ. There, there ought to be some ways that we think, ways that we embrace the truth of the scriptures that separates us. Now, I know we have a lot in common with people who uh, perhaps are unbelievers. We care about our jobs. We care about our health. We care about our family and our friends. And so our thoughts can, can move in that direction. I'm going to ask you today to expand your thinking, to embrace a thought that ought to be something we're thinking about as followers of Christ that no one else is perhaps thinking about that will have a huge impact in our lives. There are some things that we as Christians ought to think about and we ought to think about them habitually. We ought to think about them constantly. We ought to refresh our thinking about these things constantly. Like for instance, we ought to always be thanking God and celebrating the beauty of God's grace. We ought to think about that. We ought to think about the fact that we're forgiven. We ought to think about the fact that we are brand new creations in Christ Jesus, that we are made in his image. We ought to think about those things. They have profound implications for how we live on a daily basis. But I want to add to your, to your thought here this morning something that perhaps we don't think about very often that we should think about more. And this particular thought is found in Philippians chapter 3, and the 20th and the 21st verse. Let's read it uh, together. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I want to challenge you today to think more about 
heaven. And this particular verse tells us that we have a citizenship in heaven. Now, I think all of us are familiar with the idea of citizenship because every single one of us here today are citizens. Most of us, I presume, are citizens of the United States of America, but I also know that we have people that are a part of our church family from Africa and from Asia and, uh, and from Latin America. And so I imagine some of you are citizens of those particular countries, but you're living with us here in the United States of America. And so you, you have an idea of this concept of citizenship. Uh, those of you who know me, uh, well know that um, I've shared this story from time to time, but my, my parents uh, immigrated from Europe here to the United States. They are originally from the Netherlands and they moved here to the United States. And my two older brothers were actually born in Holland. And so I was the very first person, number three in the sibling list, I was the first person born here in the United States. And I often, you know, tease my parents and my older brothers that I would allow them to live in my country. I was the only one for many, many years that was a bona fide citizen of the United States. Now, since then, you know, three out of the four have become citizens of the United States. But that idea of citizenship is important. There are some rights, there are some responsibilities as citizens that we all kind of have an understanding around. And in this particular election season, it's important to recognize that one of those responsibilities is to vote. And so we wanna encourage you to engage in your civic responsibilities uh, to vote if you have eligibility. But with that said, the idea of citizenship is something of value. The Apostle Paul, for instance, at times, would use his citizenship. He was a citizen of Rome, and that citizenship wasn't, you know, something that he took lightly. He would take it out from time to time if it was to his advantage. There's an advantage to being a citizen. But I want to encourage you today is that every single one of us has dual citizenship. We are citizens of our nation of birth or our adopted nation, but we are also citizens of heaven. And it's this thought around heaven that I want you to expand your thinking to more than perhaps you do. In my own life, when I think about my life, my life will be better if I think about heaven more. And I have perhaps reason to think about heaven more than, than most people do for two reasons. I have a son who is in heaven. And so when you have blood on the other side, you tend to think about heaven more than people who perhaps haven't been you know, touched by that particular tragedy. And so I think about heaven a lot because I think about Caleb a lot. And when I think about Caleb, I think about heaven. But there's also another reason why I think about heaven, perhaps more than some of you, and that's because I'm a little bit older than most of you. I am, you know, 63 years of age. In a couple of weeks, I'll be celebrating a birthday, and I'll be 64. I know I don't look it. I know I don't look it. I look like I'm in my 30s. Come on, and everybody said... But, uh, but I think about heaven a little bit more as older people tend to do because we recognize the finite nature of life. I want you to know that my life is better when I think about heaven more. And here's my thought to every single one of you, your life will be better as well. And so I wanna unpack this particular you know, idea of thinking about heaven more and why it makes such a positive impact on our lives. We should be thinking about heaven all the time. When times are good, like you get raises or there's family harmony or there's blessings in your life or you are experiencing good physical health, you need to be reminded that this is not all there is to life, that there is this life, but then there is also the life to come. 
but especially if you're going through difficult and challenging times. When Paul was writing this letter to the church at Philippi, it was one of those seasons where life was not very good, or at least circumstantially, it wasn't without its challenges. He was suffering many hardships. He was in prison uh, for over five years. He was beaten with rod, rods and he was whipped uh, on numerous occasions. He was stoned one time. He was shipwrecked and uh, he had the constant physical discomfort, cold, hungry, thirsty, sleepless nights and so on. There were challenging circumstances and he was reminding himself in this passage that he's a citizen of heaven. And it's good to embrace and recognize in the moments where things are difficult that this isn't the only life there is. We are citizens of heaven. The fact that we belong to another place is a message that the Bible sends over and over again. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, Dear brothers, you are only visitors here since your real home is in heaven. Another translation says it this way. Friends, this world is not your home, so don't make yourself cozy in it. I don't know if many of you have had the opportunity to travel, I'm sure some of you have, where you leave the culture you're familiar with and you go to a different country. Uh, sometimes maybe on vacation or on business, you find yourself in a culture that is unfamiliar to you and you have to adjust to it. It's not that that culture is bad. It's just that you have to adjust what you're familiar with. When I was, you know, on, on a mission trip, uh, when I was fresh out of college, you know, we went to, you know, a country and it was extremely difficult. There was the middle of a civil war and people were fighting against each other. And I was so glad to be back home, you know, where I was a little bit more comfortable and I remember getting off the plane and the first thing I did is I got down on my knees and I kissed the ground. Sometimes it's nice to be back home. But what the Bible is telling us here is don't get cozy with life here. You're never going to truly fit in. There's going to be a way that you live your life that will always be at odds with the culture around you. Perhaps you're sitting on the couch and you're watching a Netflix, you know, thing and, uh, and, and you're just watching the show and as the show unfolds, it's espousing values that are foreign to you and, and you just think to yourself, why did they have to work that into the plot line? It's completely different from the way that I think and the things that I value. And I just want to encourage you that when you live here in this world, you are in this world, but you are not of this world. And there will always be things that make you feel uncomfortable. And the Bible is just saying that is natural for believers. Because we are citizens here of this land, but we are also citizens of heaven. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 14 makes the same point. For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home to come. Now, now the reason why this idea of thinking about heaven is important is for two uh, kind of obvious reasons. The first I'll just mention, and then the second we'll do a deeper dive into. The first is uh, we need to recognize that heaven is our home, home because it's, it, it transforms the way we think about the whole process of death. We, have, of all people, can live with a peace. We don't grieve the way the world grieves. They, they have no concept of another life, another kingdom, heaven, the, the promise of paradise. And that gives us great comfort when we lose people that we love. Certainly, that is the thought that Laura and I and, and, and Danielle and Luke, we... we we are comforted by the beauty of the fact that even though Caleb is not with us, we're going to see him uh, again. Heaven is real, and that's a beautiful comfort that we cherish in our hearts. But not only is it a comfort for us with our relationship with Caleb, but it's also a comfort for us. The older we get, we don't have to fear what is to come. There is this promise of paradise, a home that Jesus said he is preparing for each and every one of us. 
And that's a beautiful truth that we can, that we can believe and lay hold of that, that changes the way that we perceive our future. But the second reason that we ought to think about heaven more is because it changes the way we live right now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, we are Christ's ambassadors. As believers, you, you know the concept of an ambassador, right? Our nation, you know, has some ambassadors that are chosen by our government to serve in foreign places, to represent our country there. We, every single one of us that have put our faith in Christ, we are, in a sense, ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. God has chosen us to be representatives of his kingdom here in this foreign place, the world that we live in. And I love this verse. It encourages me so much. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin which so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. In other words, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, since we are surrounded by saints who have gone on before us, who are in heaven cheering us on, the Bible says we ought to live a certain way on earth. Thoughts about heaven should cause us to lay aside every sin and lay aside the weights that so easily entangle us, and it should motivate us to run with perseverance the race that is set out for us. Thinking about heaven changes the way we live here on earth. In fact, I think that all of Philippians chapter 3 is basically telling us how to live as citizens of heaven. How do we live our lives recognizing that we're in this world, but we are not of this world? And so I want to share with you some of the do's and don'ts of life here when you think about the beauty of the promise of heaven. So how do we live? Number one, do rejoice. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write these things to you again. And it is a safeguard to you. All throughout the book of Philippians, not just chapter 3, you get this idea of rejoicing. He says rejoice. And when you think about heaven, one of the things it should produce inside of us is this rejoicing. Rejoice, Paul says. Again, I say rejoice. We are ambassadors of the kingdom. We represent the king. And one of the most contagious, beautiful expressions of emotion that should be a part of every single one of us as we represent the king in this world is joy. God never intended that you would be the frozen chosen. God never intended that you should live your life as if you were baptized in prune juice. Joy is the emotion that we feel when we recognize that the King of Kings is in residence in our hearts. Come on, somebody. In fact, I could say it this way. If you don't have joy, people in our culture are going to be sus. Some of you got that. Some of you that got, you know, urban slang, you got, you got street cred. Let me, let me tell you where that came from. One of our young people out in the lobby uh, last Sunday came up to us and said, I love going to youth because they speak in my language. And I said, well, what words do they use? They said, well, they use words like sus. And I said, I didn't know. What's, what does sus mean? I had no idea. I'm 63. What does sus mean? And, and I found out it means suspect. If someone says that something's sus, it's sketchy, it's suspect. And I need to tell you, a Christian without joy is sus. 
Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, don't be sus. Listen, our sins are forgiven. We've been given magnificent promises, his people to live with, his presence to live in, his purpose to live for, and paradise is our eternal resting place of any emotion whatsoever that we should be exuding. It is joy. So do rejoice. Second thought, in light of heaven, please don't descend into legalism. Now let me define legalism for you here this morning. It is substituting, substituting rules for relationship. It's really about religion in the bad sense of that word. Every single religion in the world is really about human performance, what you do that somehow earns your way to appease the deity. And I don't care what religion you choose, they're all the same. But Christianity is not a religion. It is about a relationship that Jesus made possible with each and every one of us by grace. Now, don't get me wrong, there are things for us to do in God's kingdom. There are commandments to obey. There are principles that are really wise to implement in our lives and we ought to live them out out of our love for God. We're not earning our way to God, but in response to what he's done for us, there are things for us to do. But if your whole preoccupation in your relationship with God is all about rules and regulations and do this and don't do that, you will be on a treadmill of spiritual performance and you will get exhausted. And you might think that this is not a big deal. I'm telling you, the Apostle Paul thought it was a super big deal. And he fought for this understanding. The whole Jewish mindset was, you know, obey the commandments and then all of the rules and laws that the Pharisees put on top of that. That's how you get right with God. In fact, he made a list of all of these ways that you can descend into legalism in Philippians chapter three and verses four through six, you can get into legalism by trusting traditions and religious ceremonies, by relying on your lineage or your heritage, uh, by trusting in your denomination, like I'm a Catholic or I'm a Methodist, that's the reason I should get in, trusting in rules and trusting in reputation. There's all kinds of ways that you can think that you might be good enough to get to heaven. And that mindset is a killer. And the Apostle Paul is saying, don't descend into legalism. In fact, he gets pretty passionate about it. In verse two and three of Philippians chapter three, he says, watch out for those dogs. He's not mincing words here. He's just laying it on the line. They do evil things. When they circumcise, it has nothing to do with useless cutting of the body but we have truly been circumcised. We worship God by the power of his spirit. We brag about what Jesus Christ has done and we don't put our trust in weak human nature. He says those who get focused on all of that, they're like dogs. <laughs> have you ever been uh, threatened by a malicious dog, come on. Have you ever had that experience? You know, you're walking somewhere and some dog, you know, starts trying to attack you. I have this, uh, favorite place that I like to ride my bicycle. And so it's about a, a 10 mile, you know, track from my house. And so I like to do it. And, uh, and one stretch of this particular track has a house that is, you know, completely fenced in. Even the driveway has a, a fence across it. And, uh, and every single time I drive by it, these dogs come rushing for wherever they are in the yard and they rush you know, with, with leaping bounds and then they kind of screech to a halt right at the fence line and then they just bark and bark and bark and bark and I just think to myself, every time I ride by it, I'm glad they're not out. And then one time, I was riding through that neighborhood and I didn't even realize it. I had headphones on, I was listening to music, I'm riding my bike and then the, out of the blue, this dog starts barking right at the heels of my pedals. I'm, not, I'm like riding and boom, there he is barking and my heart just leapt out of my chest. And you know what I did? 
I, I, I had, you know, one foot on the pedal. I, I, I kicked that dog. And I said, get. And then I rode a little bit further. He came back right there nipping at my heel. And I, get. And then a third time, get. I don't think I ever really hit the dog. But I think the dog got the message because after that, the dog returned to its house. Let me tell you something. That's the way you need to be with legalism. That's the way you need to be with a preoccupation of human performance. You are saved by the grace of almighty God. And when you think about the beauty of heaven, you're not going to get there because you're perfect. Heaven is not the gathering of perfect people. Heaven is the gathering of forgiven people. Can I hear a good amen? All right. Number three, don't dumpster dive. Don't you dare dive in with your white linen shirt that's been cleansed by the blood of the lamb. Don't you dare dive in with your white linen shirt into the dumpster. I told Laura I just wanted to wear a white shirt this morning to illustrate the fact that we have been saved by the blood of the lamb. Now, with the beauty of what God has done for us, don't go dumpster diving to find your joy somewhere outside of your relationship with God. Listen, there are so many things that bring us joy in this life, so many things, but only if Jesus is first. Anything that you put first before Jesus will eventually rob you of the very joy you're looking for. People are dumpster diving to find their joy in popularity or perhaps power or a large purse. Ladies, the truth is, even as Christians, we can find ourselves dumpster diving. And I know it's not the intent of our hearts, but if we're looking for joy, if we're looking for satisfaction, Outside of our relationship with God, if we're putting other things before Jesus, we're dumpster diving. And you know what? Thinking about heaven, thinking about the fact that we are citizens of, of, of this marvelous paradise that God has prepared for us will help keep us from dumpster diving. You know, Elvis, he was one of the most popular, influential cultural icons in our nation's history. In fact, there was a contemporary of Elvis that basically had a famous quote about him and that said something along the lines of, there was nothing before Elvis. In other words, he was trying to communicate just in the incredible impact that Elvis had on our society. He was winsome, he was handsome, he was talented, uh, he was popular, he had you know, incredible influence. Everybody you know, responded to him in ways uh, that you would say he had it all. But one of the most famous quotes that Elvis is known for is this. You can have everything, but if you don't have true happiness, you have nothing. And unfortunately, you know the story that he, you know, was depressed and discouraged. And he, I don't know if it was by accident or intent, but he took too much medication. And he, and he ended his life journey way too soon. When you start dumpster diving, you're never going to find the joy and satisfaction in that. It comes from Jesus. Could I hear a good amen? amen? So, do rejoice and don't descend into legalism. Don't dumpster dive. Do pursue knowing him. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, as kingdom citizens, when we contemplate heaven, one of the motivations that it will produce in us is a desire to know him more. This is, a, this is kind of a, an interesting but fun and really, really moving family story. Uh, my, my sister, who is the youngest out of the siblings in my family, gave to my mom uh, a number of years ago a gift at Christmas. It was actually a gift to write a book about her life. You can do this online. You can, you can purchase this thing, and then they send you questions every single week that you answer. And so my mom, for 52 weeks, answered the questions that were prompted by this website, and she asked 
for questions from all of us as well that we might be interested in hearing from her about. And she wrote this book, and it was, it was long. It was like over 300 pages by the time it was done. And last Christmas, she gave that book to each and every, you know, sibling of mine, all of her son's and her daughter, she gave that book as a gift. It was a hardcover book, 300 pages with her life story. And I was, you know, so excited to read this. And I discovered as I began to read it uh, that there were so many things about my mom that I really never knew that didn't come up in our daily conversations, just how she grew up and how she processed life. And so I decided to text my mom every single night something that I learned about my mom that I didn't know before. One of the things that I learned was that my mom, when she was in her early 20s, was preparing to move to the United States of America and how she prepared for that move to a foreign country and how she studied the language and how she watched, you know, television programs that came from the United States so that she would understand the culture a little bit better. She did her research. And one of the things that I thought was just a natural part of our relationship actually came out of her research. She, she understood the significance of sports in American society. And even though my dad, who was an engineer, was not very athletic and didn't pay a whole lot of attention, my mom knew how important it was to us kids. And one of my earliest memories of me and my mom is out in the front yard and she would grab her glove and ball and I would grab mine and we would toss the ball back and forth. She understood the power of sports in American society and she wanted me to be prepared for it. She studied about the country she was going into in order to be better prepared. And here's the point. She didn't just do that for us transferring from Holland to the United States. She also did that spiritually. My mom took us to church every single Sunday. Her love for God, her knowledge of God connected the dots and brought me into a place where accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior was the beautiful, natural response of the atmosphere I grew up in. The truth is, when you think about heaven, I started this message telling you about how I let my mom and my dad live in my country, when in reality, they prepared me to live in this country. And you know what? When you seek after God with all of your heart, you're preparing not only your own heart, but those around you for the kingdom yet to come. Let me close with just a couple of other observations. Philippians chapter 3 tells us not to settle. The Apostle Paul expresses it this way, not that I've already obtained it or I've already arrived at my goal. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Don't ever settle. If you're in church here today and you're settled in your relationship with God, take a step to unlock your spiritual journey. That might be joining a group. That might be coming up here on Wednesday nights. That might be coming to the men's group on, on Friday night, guys night, and saying, you know what, I wanna do something different to jumpstart my relationship with God. Don't ever settle. And then he goes on to say, let go of the past. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Some of you here today are being manipulated by your past. You're living with a sense of guilt and shame about some things that happened in the past. I want you to know that when Jesus says you're forgiven, you are truly forgiven. You need to forget the former things. Behold, God is doing a brand new thing in your life. And the last thought do anticipate the future. Paul ends this by saying, I'm straining towards what is ahead. I press towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I don't think it's by coincidence that he injects the word heaven again in this passage. 
I'm looking forward to what is ahead. I'm striving for the prize that God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Thinking about heaven. Man, I, I could have spent the whole message today talking about how beautiful it is. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard all of the wonderful things that God has in store for us. It's going to be grand. If God took six days to make the world and then he promised his disciples that he was going away to prepare a place for us that he's been working on for 2,000 years, how grand is it going to be? We should live with an anticipation of what is to come. Not that any of us want to go now. We want to watch the Longhorns win the championship. but we live with an anticipation of the beauty of what is to come. And when you do, it changes the way you live here. One of my really good friends, Leon Fontaine, some of you might remember him. He came and spoke a number of times here at Shoreline, especially at our men's conferences. He was a mountain of a man. He was like a, I don't know, just picture a French Canadian you know, guy, he pastored the largest church in Canada and he was just like full of life and more than life. And this incredible friend of mine had such a passion for, for discussion about the things of God. We would always be talking about how to expand the kingdom and grow his influence in society. And I'll never forget sitting down and having coffee with him one day and he, we, were, we were just talking about heaven, a, a topic that we probably should talk about and think about more, which is the point of this message. But he was just telling me, he said, you know what, I, I get it that people sometimes feel like they need to develop a bucket list. And, and maybe some of you think this way. You think, you know, I'm going to work hard my whole life and then when I retire, I'm going to I'm gonna attack my bucket list of things that I wanna do. And there's nothing really wrong with that. But you know what he said? He said, if you think about heaven, you never have to worry about your bucket list. Because everything you ever wanted to do that you don't get to do here, you're gonna be able to get to do in heaven. Heaven is going to redeem all things. It's gonna bring back to you everything that you ever sacrificed here he said, I don't want to waste my time on earth where I can be building his kingdom and, and doing, you know, what God wants done. I don't want to waste my time writing and pursuing a bucket list. Because heaven will give you the opportunity to do everything you ever wanted to do except sin. And so my challenge to all of us here today is to think a little bit more about heaven because it will impact the way you live here. You'll live with more joy. You won't be caught in the trap of legalism. You won't dumpster dive for things that will not satisfy. You'll pursue knowing him. You'll forget the things you need to keep in your past and you'll anticipate the beauty of all that God has for you. Can I hear a good amen? Father, I pray. Father, I pray that all of us here would think a little bit differently. We should as believers. We should as followers of you. We should think differently. And Father, I pray that some of our thinking differently will move towards heaven. That we have citizenship there. Help us to embrace that, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. All right, so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. But please, with nobody leaving early or moving around, one of the ways that we get to celebrate the beauty of all that God has done for us is just to focus in on what He has done in worship. And so let's do that in this moment to solidify this message that we've just heard today. Come on, let's sing and glorify Him together.